Think of African elephants, and most of us will picture open savannah, where the largest land mammal mingles with lions, giraffes, and gazelles. In fact, a third of Africa's elephants live here, in dense, dark rainforests. Forest elephants stand just two meters at the shoulder, are more slightly built, and have pinker tusks than those on the savannah. Little else was known about them until one remarkable woman began eavesdropping on their lives. Andrea Tocalo is no ordinary scientist. By living alone in remote jungle, she's learned more about these hidden giants than anyone else on Earth. This has placed a huge burden on her shoulders. Forest elephants are now under greater threat than their savannah cousins. But Andrea could be in a unique position to help them. She's learnt their language and understands what they're thinking. She can even hear when they're in trouble. Incredibly, she believes that if we listen carefully enough, they might tell us what they need to survive. Counting dung piles has been the crude way of guessing how many there are. Their real secrets are hidden away in the vast rainforest that stretches over the Congo Basin. But in a small corner of the Central African Republic, there is a window into their lives. This is Zangabai, a vast natural clearing and a mecca for forest elephants. The forest provides all the food they need. So what is it that draws them out of the shadows? clearing contains a vital ingredient that's lacking in their diet. Volcanic rocks lie close to the surface, and the salts they contain neutralize toxins ingested with rainforest leaves and bark. Generations of elephants have come here to prospect for these minerals and settle their stomachs. Blowing down, they churn up the mud, then take a mouthful of the mineral-enriched waters. As soon as they've mastered their trunks, they're hooked. It may be that these mineral salts are also vital for the elephant's growth and fertility, which is why as many as 3,000 elephants visit Zanga each year. They'll try any tactic to control the best areas of the buy. Zangabai is not the only clearing where they can get these salts, but it's certainly one of the biggest and most frequented. When Andrea Tocalo first came here, she had an instinct that this place could help her unlock the secret lives of forest elephants. I knew immediately that this was an extraordinary place because to see wildlife in the open in the forest is literally impossible. 
I went there first in 1987 just to see the place and actually slept there. And all night there were these extraordinary elephant sounds because elephants don't sleep like we do. There was just this symphony of, of elephants. And in the morning, they were still there. And it was obvious that this was probably one of the most special places for them in uh, the Congo Basin. Andrea now understands what the symphony means. She can even hear an individual elephant's voice. But back then, she was faced with a huge problem. Each elephant visits for just a few hours, at best, a few days. So Andrea only had snapshots to go on. She might not see them again for months or years. From this constantly changing cast of characters, how could Andrea work out the big picture? was another challenge. Andrea wasn't a trained scientist. But she had been a teacher in the Bronx, one of New York's toughest neighborhoods, and she was single-minded enough to commit herself long term. She left her family and friends and set herself up in the middle of nowhere. At the beginning, I can honestly say there were a lot of things I was afraid of. I wasn't real comfortable in the dark. You're always in contact with insects, and that was something I didn't like. But if you're going to stay here, you have to get used to that, and you have to deal with it, and that's what I did. Andrea's had to turn her hand to everything, building a camp from scratch and surviving on minimal creature comforts. Oh, I thought it was huh? She's also had to place her trust in the local Bayaka pygmies. They come from an ancient tribe who have always lived in this forest. They have helped her to adapt. All my employees come from the local Bayaka tribe. They have great forest skills. They keep me out of harm's way. Um, they see things long before I even am aware of them. Every day, Andrea sets off with her loyal helpers on the 45-minute walk to the bay. It's a routine she's stuck to for 20 years. Today, like any other day, she has no idea who or what she might see. Oh my God, it's good, Kitty. I can't believe she's come back. I haven't seen her in about six months, and she's still able to keep up with her group, and she's still walking. It's not uncommon for calves to be born with disabilities. What's unusual is that Guki has survived for so long. Unlike on the savannah, there are no large predators here, which might explain why. But life in the forest for a disabled calf is by no means easy. What really amazes me about this individual is if you think about walking in the forest, the mother must come to obstacles like fallen trees. So she's evidently accommodating the the female with the, you know, the handicap. 
because she's keeping up with the group. Otherwise, she would just get lost in the forest left. Now, this place never ceases to amaze me, the things you see. Even though Andrea sees individuals only rarely, she's been able to piece together their life stories. She couldn't have reached this extraordinary position without first learning how to pick out faces from the crowd. By mid-afternoon, the crowd can be 140 strong. To keep track of so many individuals, Andrea drew pictures of their ears, which get ripped and torn in distinctive ways as they move through the jungle. She had over 4,000 identity cards before she realized her phenomenal memory was taking over. breakthrough was when you realized you knew the elephants, you felt empowered, you could just go out there and look and you knew them. Like you would see someone on the street in your hometown and recognize them. Now, her encyclopedic mind holds details of countless unfolding family sagas. During the hours she spends at the Bai, she notes all the arrivals, and crucially, who greets whom. It's late afternoon, and Andrea has noticed two related elephants who've arrived from different parts of the forest. This is uh, Mimi One, who's the matriarch of this group. Mimi One knows that Mimi Two is there. Yeah, they're heading right towards each other. There we go, there's a nice greeting going on right now. Some very low frequency. Yeah, now they're trunking each other. Yeah. Yep. That's mother and daughter. So some of these greetings are very subtle. And if you know the individuals, then you can predict them. By understanding these relationships, Andrea's made an important discovery. In the forest beyond the Bai, it's rare to see more than one elephant at a time. People assumed they led solitary, independent lives. Andrea believes that even though relatives might not stay together in the forest, they do appear to know each other's whereabouts. I think it was the general misconception about forest elephants only having small family groups. But they do have extensive networks, and they should, because, I mean, we know that about savanna elephants. Why shouldn't forest elephants still maintain these social groups? Zangabai as well as offering medicinal salts, appears to be an important venue for elephant family reunions. Andrea is beginning to understand why the Bayaka call this place the village of elephants. But even the Bayaka don't understand how the elephants appear to second guess each other's movements, how they know when other family members will be at the Bay. To get to the bottom of this, Andrea has had to start thinking like an elephant. Tuning into this forest world as they do. A heavy storm prevents Andrea being at the bay, but even from her office, she can hear the elephants calling. For two decades, she spent more time with elephants than with her friends and family. But even so, she's only witnessed a fraction of what they do. Forest elephants spend only 5% of their lives at the bay, mostly at night, when Andrea's not there.
It's at night, when they're visible only by starlight, that the elephants are at their most sociable. And most vocal. It's also when Andrea is most worried for them. Huge reunions out in the open place forest elephants in grave danger. Every year, one in ten of Zanga's elephants is taken by poachers. to study them. She feels a growing duty to protect them. She believes their conversations are rich in meaning and that one way to help is to listen to what they're saying. Today, she's adding to her vocabulary. And to get a better view of the clearing, she's working from a viewing platform. We're up pretty high. I think we're up about maybe seven meters. And you can see one end of the by from the other. And you see all the entrances to the by, so I'm able to keep track of all the individuals that come in. From up here, she can compile a kind of elephant phrasebook, which links particular behavior to the calls they make. Well, what I'm doing is I'm trying to capture vocal sequences between elephants in the clearing in order to build up a, an elephant lexicon, what these vocalizations mean. Because I know the individuals, I can also anticipate these vocal events. Someone's lost. It's probably a juvenile lost its family. An elephant's hearing is phenomenal. They can hear much deeper sounds than we can. Technology is helping Andrea to record these very low frequency calls that are normally inaudible to humans. Yeah, Milo's checking in this female. She's doing a very nice rumble. often do that when everything else being kicked up by now they do this roll, low rumble. Andrea can now identify ten different types of call. She's even discovered that each family has a distinctive voice. Oh, separated from its mother. Oh, the mother's coming. Here comes the mother. The mother hears the baby crying. There she is. She's vocalizing. There's a lot of low frequency going on now, reassuring the calf. And probably the calf is learning the family's specific calls. Back in camp, Andrea can analyze the recordings and start to see the pattern of each elephant call. This is a clip that I've pulled off. It's um, to illustrate the distress call in a young calf. And it's crying. And it makes this sort of very low, mournful sound. And um, what you'll see next in the tape is the response of two young subadult females. They approach the calf, and then they discover each other. And this looks like a small greeting. But then they go back and follow the calf, who's probably heard from its mother in the meantime, and is approaching its mother. Each sound recording gets turned into a spectrogram, giving Andrea a detailed picture of the call. This is the calf's call, and then you have these very low frequency calls here. I mean, you definitely see the calf calling, you see the mouth open, but um, to know who's making those low frequency calls is difficult. But because the calf turned around and went in the other direction, I would assume it's the mother, and it recognized its mother's voice, and now it's approaching its mother. If you collected enough of these distress calls, of calves of a certain age, you could compare them to see if this is your typical distress call. Andrea has developed an amazing skill. By learning their language, 
She can interpret what they're doing. This is a greeting between three members of the same family. They're all vocalizing. They've all recognized each other and they've all grouped together and you see their ears are flapping and they're trunking each other and they're very excited to be together again. So I assume that they were separated for a bit of time because of the, uh, the energy involved in their vocalizations. Their rumbles can travel over a mile through dense vegetation. Even though family members are spread out, they can hear an invitation to meet up. Part of the call is inaudible to our ear. It's infrasonic, but a lot of it is audible, and that's what we're hearing. But these low frequencies are the ones that travel the farthest through the forest. So, I mean, if they're having this greeting and they're like individuals related to them in the nearby forest, they're going to hear it. And a lot of times you see other members of their family show up. If their social networking is this powerful, they might even be able to warn each other of danger. The following morning, the bai is eerily quiet. He's saying that um, he's found um, blood on the trail and there's a lot of elephant tracks. Days like this remind Andrea how vulnerable these elephants are. You can see blood right here. He ran here, but you can see tracks all around him. There's more here. Don't put away tongue and slow. More here. So you can actually see where the elephant has trampled earth. He's probably panicking. And he looks pretty big. I can quote the Baba. You can see um, track right here. Pretty big nail. That's the, the uh, track of the front leg. Most forest elephants have tusks. The biggest adults carry the most ivory. This is a big patch of coagulated blood. It's pretty fresh, so it was from this night. And there's also a track. Now they're saying it might be a female. Where we are now is only about probably 30 meters from the body. But we suspect the elephant was probably shot on the other side and ran. Because we didn't hear any gunshot in the night. And generally, somebody will hear a gun if it goes off. Zangabai is within a national park. So all Andrea can do is report the incident to forest guards. It's a hard place to police. But Andrea's very presence in the area does make events like this less frequent than they'd otherwise be. Andrea wants local people to understand the value of elephants. Not just as intelligent, interesting animals, but because in their secret wanderings, elephants influence the shape and richness of the forest itself. The richer they make the forest, the more food there is for everyone. The most obvious way they do this is by engineering pathways through the tangle of vegetation. Over time, elephant feet have created wide trails, highways, that run for hundreds of miles through the forest and which link key resources. We're walking along a pretty well-worn um, elephant track and occasionally the areas open up like this because of the existence of this tree. This is a particularly favorite tree of elephants, it's Duboskia. And generally where you find these trees, the forest opens up because elephants come here and they, they eat the fruits. It's a very fibrous fruit. And we find it generally in about 90% of the elephant bun throughout the year. So there's always a Duboskia tree fruiting. And not only do they eat the fruits, but they also tend to scrape the um, bark off and eat that. Their trails are used by many other animals. Western lowland gorillas
but there's one type of fruit that only the elephants can get to. Omphalocarpum fruits are encased in a tough shell, making them virtually impossible to crack. Elephants have the perfect tool for the job. They may devour everything, but the seeds of all the fruits they eat pass unharmed through the gut. As they travel, the elephants replant the seeds, creating avenues of their favorite fruit trees. Where there's a lot of elephant activity, areas open up and sedges and grasses can take hold. They are fundamental to the gorilla's diet. These great apes would find life much harder without the elephants. But the relationship isn't an amicable one. Elephants don't like other animals sharing the clearings they created. As they dig for minerals, they actually maintain and expand these buys. Over centuries, elephants have made hundreds of small clearings in the forest, but none compares to the importance of Zanga. It's now the dry season, one of the busiest, and for Andrea, one of the most fascinating times at the buy. It's when most of the big bulls show up. This is Triple Bite. Over the years, Andrea has watched him grow from an adolescent into one of the most dominant bulls in the clearing. But he hasn't been here for nearly a year. He has traveled hundreds of miles to reach Zanga, where he knows he can find females. It's not just the females that sense the tension rippling across the bay when the big males arrive. That's going to be far, chasing Siddhartha. For the younger bulls especially, this can be a very exciting time. Young elephants, they come in, they're very feisty. And they'll just run around the by for the entire afternoon. He's like a, a young male in puberty. So he's learning how to be a male. <laughs> Unlike on the savannah, elephants rarely see each other in the forest. This clearing offers rare moments of contact. Time for the bulls to get to know each other, copied by the youngsters. Yeah, a lot of learning going on here. Sort of like a schoolyard. Elephants are so much like humans. We learn to be human and yet we end up being socialized and elephants undergo the same process. Andrea calls this bull school. A time and place to learn their position in elephant society. When I started the study I had no idea about how conscious they were and yes they do have good memories and they have personalities. And watching an elephant grow from childhood to adulthood has been Astonishing to see the changes and how much they really have to learn to become an elephant. Andrea has revealed something even more significant about Zangabai. This clearing 
is the place where elephant culture is passed on. Understanding the central importance of Zangabai places an even bigger burden on Andrea's shoulders. Her presence here is not just preventing elephant deaths, but the possible disruption of their entire way of life. She wants to protect the elephants, but she has to work within a culture that has very different attitudes and priorities to her own. For centuries, the local Bayaka have hunted forest wildlife for food, and Andrea is pragmatic about that. Traditionally, the forest for them has been their life source. That's where they find everything they need. You know, they eat elephant meat. That's not a mystery to me. Andrea steers a difficult course between her feelings for the elephants and respect for the Bayaka's traditions and needs. A lot of them will go into the forest for two or three months of the year where they'll gather honey and certain seeds that they eat. And the people that work with me, I've made their work schedule very flexible because if they want to go into the forest, they can tell me, yeah, I want to go into the forest for the next three months and I'll say fine. Because I think that's a very important part of their culture. They need to teach that to their children because ultimately it may be the only way they'll survive. Not many employers would be this flexible, but she believes it's the only way. You have to be there for them when they really need you, because otherwise they won't be there for you when you need them. And I think that's really sustained me here in many ways, that connectedness to people here. Andrea treats her Bayaka workers like family, making regular trips to buy them supplies. village is only eight miles from Andrea's camp, but the round trip on rough dirt tracks takes a whole day. It's impossible to grow anything in camp because elephants raid the crops at night. The heat and humidity means that nothing stays fresh for long. Okay, so it's a demil, a sankamil, huh? This is smoked fish, and if you buy it smoked, you can keep it up to two weeks in camp without refrigeration. I don't eat smoked fish. It's just, I mean, it's an acquired taste. They'll see. Protein is difficult to come by. What there is tends to come from the forest. Local people are allowed to hunt outside the national park, but laws control which animals can be taken as bushmeat and how many. Even so, Andrea knows there's elephant meat under the counter. The guards that patrol the forest do their best to contain this black market. More commonly, they pick up people who have taken too many animals or who have the wrong licenses for their weapons. Most people are just trying to feed their families. Hello, 
Elephant meat is a delicacy, but it's rarely on the menu. They are hard to kill with a normal shotgun. And Andrea's work is making a difference. When I first started working with the Bayak, I think we all had... Sadly, local opinions are increasingly affected by bigger changes sweeping across the region. Andrea is seeing more and more elephants entering the Bai. She thinks they're being pushed into Zanga, as commercial logging disrupts their extensive network of paths. What's more, ivory is back in demand. And the tusks of forest elephants are most sought after. They are pinker and much denser than those of savanna elephants, resulting in a rose ivory that's highly prized for carving. Its value is astronomical. A pair of tusks raises $90,000 on the black market. It's no wonder some local people get drawn into poaching. Human conflict in neighboring countries floods the area with weapons. The guards confiscate many of them, but there are plenty more, and they're largely pointing at Zanga. It's the easiest place to find and kill forest elephants. Unless, of course, Andrea is there. I will react immediately to any threat. I can be out at the clearing having a nice afternoon and then I hear gunshot and I'm gone. I'm back to camp on the radio trying to get guards motivated. In many ways, Andrea is the only person standing between the elephants and mass slaughter. After years of wanting to be here, she now dare not leave. Even trips to the local town could endanger the elephants, because she's under surveillance too. Her absence from the bai never seems to go unnoticed. The poachers are very localized. I mean, they live in the village. I know them. They know me. So when I'm driving out of town, they see me and everybody... I mean, people are going, Andrea, by the side of the road. So they know I'm leaving. And that's a worry because there have been incidences where there is poaching when I've been gone. Now, this video was taken when I, I wasn't at the bar. I was taken by one of the assistants and he told me about this bull. This is an elephant Andrea knows well, but he now has a line of wounds across his flank. He's a young boy, he's about 35 to 40, his name is Hezzy. Now, the wounds are definitely bothering. You see this often in elephants when they've been wounded. They'll spend a lot of time either throwing water on themselves or mud. Because those wounds are pretty deep. I mean, they pierce the, the epidermis, which is about a half an inch thick. Andrea can tell from the pattern of wounds, this was not the result of a fight. That many wounds, I'd say a Kalashnikov. Hezi has returned to the likely scene of the crime. Perhaps because it's also the best place to treat his wounds. But since this video was taken on May 13th, we haven't seen him. So he might, might have even died, might have developed an infection from the wounds he sustained. With the stakes becoming higher, even Andrea cannot live in such remote forest without protection. She needs to share the weight of responsibility. And a chance has come. She's been asked to help with a pioneering study at the other end of the elephant's range. It means 
for a few weeks. She will have to leave the elephants at Zangabai. Forest elephants inhabit a huge area, stretching over two million square miles. But there could be fewer than 125,000 left. This is Gabon. Where the African rainforest meets the ocean. It's considered to be one of the last safe havens for forest elephants. It couldn't look more different from Zanga. Beyond the endless beaches, there's a mosaic of savanna, forest and swamp. It's a new experience for Andrea. She's used to seeing groups of over a hundred elephants together. Here, just seeing one is a challenge. You don't see many, but when you do see them, they're doing extraordinary things that I've never seen before in my life. have adapted to this diverse range of habitats, even snorkeling across flooded channels and swamps. This place gives me a lot of hope in terms of elephant conservation, just because the elephants are inaccessible. People can't hunt in these swamps, and so that is a refuge for them. However, there's no clearing like Zanga to see elephants and monitor what they do. Researchers have had to find a different way to tune into their lives. Andrea has joined Peter Regg from the Elephant Listening Project at Cornell University. He's an expert in acoustic research, something he hopes will reveal more about forest elephants. So this is the hard drive yeah. to store the data. And then this is the computer, microcomputer, okay. that's actually processing the sound. He's putting up remote listening devices to eavesdrop on them. But he needs Andrea's help because only she can translate their calls. We're still in kindergarten in learning exactly what their vocalizations mean and the social context in which they occur. And this is where Andrea is so vital to what we're doing now is that she knows the behavior of the elephants very, very well. These recording units contain state-of-the-art microphones, specially designed to pick up low-frequency okay. calls. They can be left running for three months, 24 hours a day. Each one records rumbles from over a square mile of jungle. It's better than CCTV. Yes, okay, so we're... Finished. Ready to go. It's, it's absolutely a kind of spying on, on elephants. Listening in on their conversations in order to understand um, what they're doing, how many there are, where they're going. Peter already has 33 of these bugging devices deployed in the rainforests of Central Africa. Now, he needs Andrea's help to decode the latest recordings. The different rumbles tell Andrea how many elephants are present and what they're doing. Okay, that for me, this first call, may be an adult female. And this might be a response to that call. Hmm. Let's try this one then. This is young animal again. Young yeah. animal. Just by listening. She can tell which members of the family may be vocalizing, and why. 
would you call those all protest calls? Or you said also sometimes no, they just No, I think they're lost separated. calls. Lost I think they're separated. So you can, you're actually hearing a difference between a protest and a loss. Yes. Those sound like, to me, lost calls. Mm -hmm. It starts low and it goes up. The structure looks the same. Yeah, well, that's one of the problems is I need to know a little more from your ear. Mm -hmm. What do I need to be looking for to make that distinction? Mm -hmm. Andrea's knowledge will help Peter create a visual record of specific elephant calls. He can then refer to this library and learn even more about elephant life here. You don't have anything before that, do you? Probably. Recorded? Did you no, clip oh, it out? No, I'm sure I do. This is clipped out, though. I mean, it we can go back and It almost sounds like mating. Really? Yeah, because you've got a lot of these high-pitched things going in. Huh. Without even seeing elephants, it's possible to translate their rumbles into information about breeding success. They've also revealed the dangers elephants face. Before his study began, Peter was told there was no poaching in the area. That's not the case. These, I'm pretty sure, are high-powered rifle shots. So these devices also spy on the poachers. By pinpointing hotspots of illegal hunting, guards could target areas more strategically and efficiently. A lot of frogs. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are definitely yeah. Ones. Yeah. And again, this is a bit strange because the intensity changes. That's a tree. Really? That's a tree. This first thing right here, this first sound you hear, mm -hmm. it's the crack, and then it's the kick, 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 kick. Mm, That's a nice. I don't that's know, a Andrea. No, I no. I, sure. <laughs> I put money on that one. Hear that? And that's the whole thing going down. It might get hung up on something. True. Yeah. A lot of trees out there. Yeah, it's very complicated tree fall. <laughs> 20 years in the forest has taught Andrea what to listen out for. And Peter knows the value of her extensive memory bank. I'm very concerned, actually, about the huge knowledge that Andrea has about these elephants. I find it phenomenal what she remembers. No one else comes anywhere close to what she has. So I think it is critical that we basically kind of extract this information from her brain. This experience has shown Andrea how her knowledge could help elephants across their whole range. But she will always feel a strong connection to the individuals back at Zanga that have been her life for so long. I probably think about these elephants during my waking hours about 90% of the time. I'm very concerned about them. I mean, I feel it's my moral responsibility to, to be there. Hopefully, when I get back, you know, the numbers will be the numbers I'm expecting to see. When Andrea returns to Zanga, there's depressing news. More poaching has been reported in the area. The demand for ivory is now threatening the very existence of forest elephants. Recent data has shown we've maybe lost between 40 and 50 percent of the population in, in the Central Africa area. So there's increasing pressure on this area where there are still animals left over. Zangabai continues to be a magnet for forest elephants and a privileged window into their lives. That's Marnie. Oh, there's a new calf. For the next 60 years, this calf could return time after time to take the salts, meet up with family, and to find a mate. That's nice. That's a new 
new baby for today. Just trying to figure out what to do with his trunk. But if Andrea were to leave, who knows what upheavals he and his family would face. optimist about the future for animals here so I mean I get a little bit um, emotional about it but the reality is these animals if they're not protected they're they're going to be poached for two decades she has carried this responsibility on her shoulders but she cannot stay here forever been here for 20 years and I'm beginning to feel my age I think I'll stay here as long as I can walk and I can get support to do what I do because I love this place I mean there's a lot of downsides to my job but coming here every day is is what makes it all worthwhile and just seeing them right here maybe the pioneering study in Gabon will eventually take the pressure off her and the remote listening devices will become her ears in the forest allowing elephants to tell us of the dangers they face as they continue their conversations through the jungle. Mm -hmm.